This program is a presentation of UCTV for educational and non-commercial use only. So welcome to the Rosenfeld Symposium. Uh, we are here to celebrate Art's uh, completion of two terms at the California Energy Commission and his many decades of contributions to energy efficiency. Uh, the theme of this symposium is the next generation of energy efficiency. We have a crowded agenda, so we have omitted the introductions uh, for the speakers, which probably isn't a bad thing since you know most of them. But I will, um, of course, uh, not listen to my own uh, requirements because I wanted to introduce my co-moderator for this symposium and Art's old friend, Henry Kelly, who is now at the Department of Energy to introduce the first speaker. And I hope that will be the longest introduction of any of the speakers after this. Henry? Uh, thank you, Alan. And uh, to be introduced as uh, Art's friend is a great honor because uh, he, of course, is not just a friend, but uh, a mentor. And I guess the uh, easiest way to characterize our relationship is I, for 30 years, I've never felt that I'd thought through an idea entirely until I'd talked through it with Art. But with that, I would like to introduce our first speaker, uh, who is Eric Heitz of the Energy Foundation. And uh, in keeping with, the, with Alan's instructions, th th it was also an extremely brief introduction, which... Thank you very much, Henry. Thanks, Alan. Wow, this is a lean and mean conference, clearly. Um, and I'm delighted to be here. Um, it's, it's really an honor, and I want to thank our hosts, first of all. Um, if I close this thing, am I going to get in trouble? I'll just partially close it. Um, I want to thank our hosts and, and note that I'm very proud on behalf of the Energy Foundation to help sponsor uh, this event. Um, and just walking in here as I stroll down the walk, I'm proud to see so many, so many of the people that have helped build this field, um, so many leading thinkers in energy efficiency all gathered in one place. Um, so Art Rosenfeld, I see there's Art in the front row. Art Rosenfeld um, seems like a pleasant enough name, but for all of you and for many more people in the energy efficiency field around the world, we know that Art Rosenfeld is much, much more than a name. Art is a one-man institution. He's a walking, talking, calculating energy efficiency icon. And I know I speak for everyone today on the panel and out in the, in the audience when I say I am very proud to be here to honor Art and his long service to this field, and proud to continue, as the topic of this conf conference reminds us, today and tomorrow, to fight to advance efficiency around the globe. Um, I just don't think we can go too much farther without a round of applause for Art. There may be many, but let's have one right now. Now, as many of you might know, the, the Energy Foundation funds policies to advance energy efficiency and renewable energy in the U.S. and China. Uh, we're the largest non-governmental funder in that area, in both the U.S. and China. Uh, and we, last year, we, our revenues totaled about $100 million, and we run very low overhead, so $90 million went out into the field to try to advance efficiency and clean technologies, primarily funding policy to open new markets for these technologies. So what you may not know is that Art was absolutely instrumental in founding the Energy Foundation. I'll tell you a little story about that. 20 years ago, when MacArthur, Rockefeller, and Pew, three of the largest foundations in the world, were considering a $100 million, 10-year investment in this new idea, the Energy Foundation, and a couple of upstart analysts, me included, Hal Harvey, who you may know, Tom Strand, were the other two, 
Art was one of the energy experts that the three presidents brought in to say, is this crazy? Or we're going to put $100 million down on this thing called energy efficiency. We don't even have a compact fluorescent light bulb that costs less than $5. Is this, is this even a good idea? Well, a few days later, I uh, had a conversation with Peter Goldmark, who was then the president of the Rockefeller Foundation, and he asked me, he said, Eric, is it really true that appliance efficiency standards can, can reduce as much electricity as all the nuclear fleet has supplied so far? And I said, yeah, you got that right. And I said, there's the power of art. Clearly, art has gotten, gotten through. So thank you, art. Your influence was instrumental in founding the Energy Foundation. I've been working in various jobs at the Energy Foundation for the last 20 years. And uh, you can, another convert to art's philosophy of efficiency. So we've come a long way. Um, over, the, over the last 20 years, I've been in the business building on the great work of art and many people in this room. And we're now looking at a whole new generation of energy efficiency programs at a scale that really matters. And let's, let's look at just a couple examples. I'm sure you're going to cover these during the day, but I just want to tick through a couple. China. People have heard about the China Thousand Enterprises Program. This is based on the EU model of energy efficiency agreements with the thousand largest enterprises, saving 247 million metric tons of CO2 annually in 2010. <clears throat> they met their goals early. Now China's going for the top 5,000 enterprises, which could save double that potential. So that's a huge, huge savings. Another one, um, China's air conditioning standards. Um, these could save as much electricity as a Three Gorges Dam. China fuel economy standards, most rapidly adopted in history. China's leadership on global warming, 45% to 40 to 45% energy intensity target. This is built on their understanding that they can implement efficiency. And China sees this not just as good for the economy or good for uh, saving money and the environment, they're building a whole export industry and it's built around energy efficiency. Take a look in the US. What's the next generation there? I point out that Henry and I were just talking earlier about the huge investment in the stimulus bill. This is an extraordinary new investment. Now we still have to figure out how to spend it well. I think we have good ideas how to spend it. We need to make sure the systems and structures to spend it quickly get in place. But that's a huge, huge movement. Those of you who are tracking building codes, the IEC, who's the de facto code setter for 35 states, is looking at a 30% improvement in building codes. How about California's new TV standard? 50% improvement by 2013. And for those of you who went to the Las Vegas equipment show, you can, you can see most of the large manufacturers are already meeting those standards. We can do these things. Two other points from big states. Many of the people in this room were instrumental in the California PUC's decision and, and the utilities in this room as well, working together on approving a $3.1 billion uh, energy efficiency program over the next three years. That's the largest efficiency program in human history. But Massachusetts is not far behind. Massachusetts last year increased its efficiency program fourfold to about six to over 600 million per year. And an important thing to note on the theme of next generation of, of efficiency, and that is that Massachusetts revenues come partly from the cap and trade program on carbon. Half of the revenues for that program come from REGI, which is the nation's first utility sector cap and trade. And this is an interesting theme I think we're gonna see going forward nationally and internationally. And the list goes on and on. You're gonna hear more about them today. But let me close with, with some big questions along the theme of this conference. I think the really big question is, how do we scale? If we're gonna solve global warming, if we're gonna solve the whole host of issues around energy from, from health-related issues to water-related issues, and, and the list goes on, we have to scale energy efficiency. Four questions around that. How do we finance it? Utilities are a great way, and we've seen a, a two-fold increase a doubling of utility efficiency revenues for, to around $4 billion in the last couple of years. How do we get Wall Street involved? 
how do we get Wall Street as an investor? How do we aggregate a lot of different investments and get them into private markets? First question. Second, how do we implement at scale? What are the institutions? What are the human capital needs? Third, technology. How do we keep inve inventing the new technologies that make efficiency renewable? And finally, people, and this comes back to art. How do we find the next 10 Art Rosenfelds around the world? Now, in closing, let me say that however long it takes us to find the next 10 arts and find them we must, everyone in this room knows that we owe a great deal to the first art, Art Rosenfeld, truly the founder of the modern efficiency movement. Thank you, Art, and thanks to everyone here today. I look forward to joining you all in the discussion. Thank you very much, Eric. <clears throat> now we're going to move to the first uh, panel session, which looks like this. You know, uh, actually, there's a, there's a better um, uh, and shorter title than I had, which was called The Supply and Demand for Arts. And I think we might, we might overuse this whole, th the whole expression in, uh, today, but let's, let's keep going for the moment. Uh, the world, the United States, and California have ambitious goals to reduce carbon emissions, energy consumption, and energy costs. Meeting these goals will require many new experts in energy efficiency, as well as reorientation of traditional disciplines and professions. In short, we need boatloads of Art Rosenfelds. Well, perhaps not a boatload, but lots of people with new skills in reducing energy use. And who is going to hire those new experts? And who is going to train them? And that is the topic of this morning's discussion. We all know about the thousands of new weatherization experts that the nation will need. But what about those with graduate and postgraduate skills? So today, we will focus on this group, the professionals with bachelor's degrees, master's degrees, and doctorates, being trained today in California's great universities. A recent study by Chuck Goldman at Lawrence Berkeley Lab estimated that a quarter of the new jobs in the energy efficiency services sector would be in this category. So on your right is the demand panel. These are the institutions that want to hire these experts. These are the institu uh, institutions that need engineers trained to understand energy consumption and savings opportunities. Uh, these are the economists uh, that know how to deal with the complex, imperfect markets and management experts familiar with the financial benefits of reduced operating costs and, of course, the researchers who will recognize and perfect the next generation of energy saving materials, processes, equipment, algorithms, and policies. The demand side is represented by Roland Risser at the Department of Energy, speaking for the government, Jean Rodriguez from Southern California Edison, speaking for the utilities, Jim Davis from Chevron Energy Solutions, speaking for the ESCOs, and also industry, and Cheryl Carter from the Natural Resources Defense Council, speaking for the NGOs. These individuals represent some of the largest and most influential employers. Nevertheless, even more of the jobs will be created by firms and institutions with less than 10 employees. That half of the demand side isn't sitting on our panel, but you are in the audience and I hope that uh, we have time to hear from you, too. Now, on your left is the supply panel. These are the institutions that will supply California and the United States and the world the new Art Rosenfelds and other experts in energy efficiency. They are Dan Kamen from UC Berkeley, Dave Austin from UC Santa Barbara, Jane Woodward from Stanford, and Andy Hargadon from UC Davis. 
Again, these universities represent only part of the picture because many other excellent universities and colleges are training students to become experts in energy efficiency. And I also know that faculty from those campuses are in the audience, and I trust that they will offer their views at the end and in the hallways afterwards. Now, here's our plan for the discussion. First, the demand side will briefly describe, and I, I want to emphasize briefly describe the kinds of efficiency experts that they need and their successes and maybe lack of successes in obtaining them. Next, the uh, supply siders will describe their university's efforts to create those specialists. Where do students on your campus learn about energy efficiency? Then we will give time for each side to uh, respond to the points uh, 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 raised by the other. And if time permits, we'll solicit comments from other suppliers, demanders, and perhaps even a few of my students out there in the audience. Uh, so let's begin with uh, Roland Risser from the U.S. Department of Energy. Thank you. I guess I'll start with the context for my comments. When I was at PG&E, we doubled the number of people working on energy efficiency in order to meet the aggressive CPUC goals. And at DOE, we are increasing the number of staff working on energy efficiency. I'm working in the building technologies program. I'm adding about 20 percent uh, to my existing staff. I also have a challenge with 10 percent of the veterans uh, in that program retiring at the end of this year, so it's an additional hiring opportunity. So the context is that, and the, what I think is missing is the technologists generally do not have the big picture view of what business looks like, and the folks with the business background do not have the technological knowledge of what's going on in the world. I'm going to give you some more detailed specifics. Uh, on the technological side, the, one of the gaps I'm noticing is a lack of knowledge and experience with communication technology, sensors, and controls. We're going to get much smarter appliances, pieces of equipment, and uh, an example is I met with many vendors who have a chip for one dollar that they're putting in a piece of equipment that will allow communication and interoperability. This is going to change the way we look at uh, technology and uh, its use in homes and businesses. Another area is social science. I believe that a gap is understanding human behavior. We need to make sure people understand that. And to the extent we don't have automation from the sensors and controls, we need to improve our user interface. The third area is business. I mentioned that briefly. The gap here is for researchers on my, on my side. We need to think about the cost of the products that we are working on. Uh, that's the cost to you know, selecting the materials correctly and manufacturability. We also need to make sure we're connecting with the end users because that's where it's, it, uh, the rubber meets the road. We need to make sure we've taken that into consideration. And then last comment is I believe we're answering the easy question. I believe what we're doing here is dealing with what in the uh, utility world we used to call new construction. We're looking with new hires out of uh, the marketplace. That is actually easier than the bigger challenge, which is the many people already out and in the field who also need to be trained. Thank you. Thank you very much. Gene Rodriguez from Southern California Edison. I will take a slightly different spin on this topic, if you don't mind, because I want to start by issuing a challenge. Each of the institutions you see on the right side of the stage from our side, left side of the stage for you all, they do a wonderful job of supplying my company, Southern California Edison, with the engineers, the economists, the marketing specialists, and others who help us to make energy efficiency a core part of the way California does business and a core part of the way people live in the state of California. For my goodness gracious, if you have a half a billion dollar a year enterprise in just one utility that is doing nothing but advancing energy efficiency in solar, that is doing nothing but ensuring that every home and business is, is more energy efficient, then we are 90 percent of the way there and they have done a tremendous job. But where they have failed, <laughs> where they have failed is in producing the next generation of arts. And I will tell you why. It's because of your poor recruitment practices. What you do is sign up the easy ones. 
You sign up the kids who are committed to causes. The world is full of kids who are committed to causes this day. I don't need someone who is passionate about a cause. I need someone who understands how to have cause and effect. Because that is the genius of Art Rosenfeld. There is not a single person in this room here today, I would wager, who hasn't had Art use his cool intellect, his ability to get massive amounts of data and make it meaningful, and convince us to do something about it, to convince us to do the right thing. The fact that California is the international leader in energy efficiency is because people are doing something, not just studying something. It's not just a degree that says you're sustainable. It's a degree that says, I know how to make something happen. The next generation of arts, the next generation of true leaders in the efficiency space need to be people who understand how to make a difference. What we need are people who come to work not just to be green, but to make the world around them green, to make the businesses and the homes in our territory green. That's what we need from you. So we await the next generation of arts. <laughs> Thank you, Gene. Uh, Jim. OK, I'm going to have to crank up the passion here. <laughs> um, <laughs> wow, that woke me up. Um, Chevron Energy Solutions is a 400-person services company, part of the larger Chevron Corporation. And I say services company because our assets are our people. And the 400 people that we have at Chevron Energy Solutions are uh, mechanical, electrical, architectural uh, engineers. Uh, they're professional project and construction managers. Uh, they're uh, project finance experts. They're business development experts with uh, fortes and um, environmental assessments and, and audits. Um, this is a very highly skilled, specialized uh, workforce. And the only way that we can scale this business and grow this business is by feeding it more of those types of experts. So when I lie awake at night worrying about how am I going to grow Chevron Energy Solutions, I'm not worried about is there opportunity. Um, the opportunity for us to help our customers, which for us is mainly in the public sector um, and other businesses, and in fact, Chevron itself is our single largest customer. Many of you may not know is that Chevron uh, uses about $7 billion worth of energy to run its worldwide operations. So the opportunity to increase its energy efficiency um, is, is tremendous as well, and we spend a lot of time working on that. Uh, but the, uh, the, the key is, uh, when I'm lying awake at night, is how do I feed the business with more qualified people? That's my biggest limitation of growth. So I look to the marketplace and try to recruit, and we use search firms to go out and try to find some of these people, and at times it seems like we're giving them a tall order, like a, you know, finding a needle in a haystack uh, to find these types of people. And the people that we currently have, we hold on to passionately. Uh, we don't want to lose any of our people because it's very hard to replace uh, these 400 people. So we look to academia uh, to help supply us with uh, the, uh, the growth uh, of, our, of our engine. And in times we see, uh, see some people um, that are, are good, but in a lot of cases we have to take the people that we can get from universities and then do a lot of on-the-job training. We have to invest sometimes years in developing these people. So if we really want to scale the energy efficiency business uh, in the United States and around the world, uh, we've got to find a way to accelerate the development of the next generation of energy efficiency experts. Thank you. And uh, last but not least, let's hear from the NGOs, Cheryl Carter. Well, I'm going to start off by giving you guys um, a little bit more of an idea of what NGOs do with regard to energy efficiency, because I don't think everybody is necessarily aware of the breadth um, of work that NGOs um, do in this area. NRDC's work encompasses end-use energy efficiency programs, building codes and standards, 
collaborations and partnerships, for example, um, working with manufacturers or retailers to make sure the specifications for their products um, and services are um, very energy efficient. We pursue those things in regulatory and legislative arenas, in collaborations and partnerships, and sometimes through lawsuits, although we really try to avoid that one, by working on making sure that the regulation is set up in a way to uh, avoid that scenario. We get involved depending on the opportunity and the issue uh, everywhere from uh, technical specifications of products, program design, um, evaluation, results analysis, uh, to uh, regulation and legislation. Advocacy is present throughout all of those um, issues and, and work. Um, what we need is really the perfect candidate um, who has very strong technical skills, communication skills, um, some law background, regulatory background, utility regulation, uh, and um, both written and oral communication skills. We want it all. We want art, basically. That's what we need. We're in the midst of a hiring process right now, and I can tell you, we have stellar candidates from all of the institutions uh, represented up here, uh, as well as others. One of the things, and I think it's uh, probably a consistent theme here, that we really need more of is, are basically arts. Um, somebody, people that combine all of those skills, they're out, art, out there, but not in great enough number. And as someone who works in more than just California and a lot of the states um, that are just adding energy efficiency programs, just starting these things up, um, there's not nearly enough to go around. So we need more. We need to increase the number of institutions out there working on this um, and including this and integrating it into their, their curriculum. Um, I wanted to just mention that NRDC is releasing a report today authored by Sierra Martinez, um, who is our current Clean Energy Solutions Fellow from the MAP program at Stanford. Um, Debra Wang, who is Director of California Energy Programs and an ERGI. Uh, and as well as um, James Chu, former NRDC fellow, now with McKinsey. This report describes how California has restored its energy efficiency leadership and how it's achieved net benefits over the last decade um, that have increased nearly fivefold to $5 billion, that have increased um, annual savings almost sixfold to uh, the equivalent of the energy used by San Francisco and San Mateo combined and that has increased California's productivity since 1980 by 50%, while the rest of the country has only increased by 15%. But what it really illustrates is what folks in the field of energy efficiency have accomplished, and it's the tip of the iceberg, not today's iceberg, the old really big icebergs that haven't melted yet, um, but I think of what can be really accomplished by the people in this room who are entering or looking to enter the field of energy efficiency. NRDC has dedicated this report to Dr. Rosenfeld, whose visionary leadership in the field of energy efficiency has inspired new generations to follow in his footsteps. Thank you, Cheryl. Now we're going to hear from the supply side, and I hope that you can respond to some of the, uh, some of the some of the things that keeps Jim Davis up late at night, and uh, maybe even uh, Gene's comments. Uh, Dan, you, uh, you're the first. Well, first of all, it's a, it's a pleasure to be here, and there's, there's no greater pleasure for me than to get to honor Art for all the things he's done. And I, I want to begin, before I get to my vigorous agreement with Gene Rodriguez's comments, um, I, I want to uh, dispel the big lie that is going on today. And the big lie is that art is known as this expert on efficiency. But from our perspective at Berkeley, art is actually the father of supply side issues. I know that must pain art greatly <laughs> to hear supply side mentioned as the primary accomplishment. But from our perspective, the founding of the Energy Resources Group, the sending of the current Secretary of Energy to DC, a thing we'll share with Stanford as a, as a process. The, uh, the process to send a number of the undersecretaries, sending the science advisor to the president, is all a supply side problem for which, Art, I fear you're going to have to take more credit there 
than even the billions and trillions on the efficiency side. And so if there was ever a, um, an argument for doing the supply side right, I really think it's the type of, of learning that students within ERG, and Cheryl mentioned ERGies as a unit of energy, as a unit of human activity, and that really also goes down to art. And I know that later on today there will be a bit of a surprise announcement on, on the unit side of the story, so we'll leave that one. But I, I want to spend my 12 seconds on a vigorous uh, agreement, really, with Gene's comments. And, and the real issue is that for all of the neat places that supply of innovative energy individuals has come up, it's largely been in the interstices of society. When programs like ERG were new, it was recruiting inter interesting disgruntled individuals from physical science or economics and giving them a place to grow into energy leaders on the supply or the efficiency side. The moment we're in now, though, calls for something very different. It doesn't call for neat programs that fill unusual little gaps. It calls for making supply side of experts who don't see a division, don't see supply or demand, but see a synergy. And it sees for those types of individuals to now be trained in universities, in companies, in government, in NGOs, in a way that's much more central. Energy is the biggest piece of our economy. Clean energy, energy efficiency, should be the biggest piece of it going forward. And yet it still exists, despite all the money and effort right now, as an accidental home or location for many of the individuals. If we're going to do this right, I fear we have to call on everyone on this side of the table who has deep pockets, even if they don't feel them today, to say which university or college or corporate campus can I help support so that there is a physical home, so that researchers and practitioners don't have to run between buildings on different corners of the Google campus or at Berkeley's campus or Stanford or UC Davis or MIT or anywhere, but they co-locate, so they, infor they, they themselves form a center of power. That doesn't exist. And even with some of the very exciting new investments in energy, most have been, logically enough, in programs. In half a billion dollars on biofuels on our campus, in a quarter billion initially at Stanford on, on a program, et cetera, et cetera. These need to become new homes of people where you train in areas that are the area of the moment. And in 10 years, the moment may be very different. Right now, we're maybe are entering a smart grid information technology piece. Five years from now, it could be something else. So we need more supply side out of the demand siders to make this process go forward. Thank you, Dan. Uh, David Austin. Uh, thank you. I'm also very delighted to be here to honor uh, the fantastic work that you are, have done. I'm actually a relative newcomer to the field. I uh, uh, just to give you one word about. Uh, Myself, about five months ago, I was uh, deep in retirement, and uh, I was asked if I might uh, come to the University of California, Santa Barbara, to help with their energy efficiency program. They had just received a, uh, a, a grant from the Department of Energy and Energy uh, Frontier Research Center, and, uh, uh, which, by the way, was funded with stimulus money, <clears throat> and so I uh, gladly took up the opportunity. So I'm actually one job that has been created by the uh, AARRA. <laughs> I want you to know that. Uh, now, I also want to uh, agree with Gene's challenge, uh, but uh, I want to do so in a slightly different way. I want to tell you about a student, uh, a student that I think actually fits the profile of what you're looking for, Gene, of which I believe there are many, many more. And uh, this is a person by the name of Amaret. Um, she likes to be known as Mo, though. And Mo came into my office. Uh, last week to tell me what she was doing. She has just uh, graduated last year uh, with her doctorate in material science, a brilliant student, and had done some fabulous work. But she had the passion that you referred to. Uh, and more than that, uh, Mo actually is involved on campus in some just absolutely fabulous way. Uh, first of all, she herself is doing some analyses of some of our laboratory research buildings, uh, doing a very scientific uh, analysis of them with regard to energy efficiency along the lines that ARC pioneered. But more than that, she has mobilized some, she has tapped into that energy and passion that you described, especially amongst the undergraduates. There, there is a group, for example, 
They're called the lab rats that she coordinates. And what the lab rats do, this is a group of about 25 students, they go around to the various research buildings, the laboratories, and they identify areas uh, for energy efficiency. Uh, and uh, just one example here is in all of the chemistry and related facilities which uh, use fume hoods, and many of you know, and in fact Art was a pioneer when he was at the, uh, uh, when he was heading up the California Institute for Energy Efficiency, he and some of his people did a fabulous uh, 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 analysis which showed that it was the turbulence of the air coming in the front of a fume hood that, that resulted in the, the, the greatest loss of efficiency, and if you just simply brought the air up inside the hood instead of in the front, you'd save an enormous amount. What Mo and her lab rats are doing is they're going around and the fume hoods are all, of course, retrofitted in the way that Art prescribed, but now they're actually putting sensors on the fume hoods and monitoring those so that they can tell where the fume hoods are. And the users, the faculty, actually are going along with this and there's been a substantial improvement. Another example of what Mo is doing is that uh, she and a group of uh, actually all undergraduates at UC Santa Barbara contribute to a fund called the TGIF Fund. It's the Green Initiative Fund, TGIF. And they raise, out of their own pocket, and these are students who are paying hefty tuition and fees today, they raise $200,000 a year for this fund, which they then deploy for various purposes around campus to, uh, <clears throat> for purposes of energy efficiency, to, to promote energy efficiency. So Mo, in my opinion, is the kind of person that you want to look for, Gene. And I think if you looked, you'll find plenty of Mo's around. Um, you may not find them, however, in the, and I'm going to challenge you with regard to your recruiting practices. I used to be a recruiter when I worked for AT&T Bell Labs, actually, at, at Stanford. I was uh, the chair of the uh, PhD recruiting team. And I found that I could be a whole lot more effective if I just discarded the traditional uh, sign-up sheet and standard but, but actually try to find out the Mo's of the world, the, the people who you really want to target. And I think maybe the universities will have to cooperate with you, but I would challenge you to think about your recruiting processes also. If you just go into a campus and say, let's sign up kids and wait in line and then come in to see me in, in a room that we set aside, I don't think you'll find the Mo's. Thank you very much. Uh, Jane Woodward. Art, it's great to be here. What a pleasure. Um, I'm going to take a little bit of a different tack than my table mates, panelists here have taken so far. And um, I guess the main thing I want to share with the, the panel on the other side, and I think all four of us would agree, I, I pulled Dan just before we got up here, is we are awash, I'll say at Stanford, with rabid, talented, driven, motivated, thinking and doing students at Stanford. So this, the, 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 the supply on that end, coming into Stanford, coming through, they're coming through for a one-year master's program in atmosphere and energy, the number of MBAs that are also now jointly doing an IPER master's program, which stands for Interdisciplinary Program on Environment and Resources, and that's been added so MBAs can blend that in. So what Stanford's really struggling with is, is the population of students committed and interested in sustainable energy and in energy efficiency is off the charts. We actually are in a situation where we're getting some good articulation of leadership at the top of our institution about energy efficiency and sustainability as well. Our challenge is the, the landscape in between that incredibly powerful pool of students and the leadership at the top, which is how do we align our institutions from a faculty structure point of view, and I'm not a tenure track faculty person, I've been a consulting professor for 20 years, um, but how, how do we adapt our institutions fundamentally, because at its core Stanford's a research institution with some fabulous teaching that goes on as well, and we actually need, I would echo what Dan said, we need partnerships, we need the kinds of partnerships that we've seen in Silicon Valley and technology companies. We need the kind of partnerships that the oil and gas industry brought to our School of Earth Sciences and said, let's make a long-term commitment. We'll come and even teach classes. We'll come and spend time with you and be on advisory boards and talk to you and talk to your faculty about what kinds of research is useful to us and what kinds of teaching we need. So I think there's been lots of good progress at Stanford and I think it will continue 
which is how can we all move closer to each other so we get a better understanding of what your needs are. But my sense is that at the, the fundamental pool of talent, our greatest challenge is it's really exploding almost at the root of the institution. And it is because of people like Art and Amory that that's happening. I just want to give some of you, and, and I, I probably am kind of preaching to the converted in terms of giving folks a sense of, of what's going on. And, and it's not as our pipeline to support these students isn't what it needs to be. But there's kind of how are we coping in the meantime? To, and, and the meantime can't afford to be very long. I think some of you are aware, you know, the, all the legs of the stool that need to be in place to produce more arts, given that our biology department hasn't figured out how to clone him physically, is, is if we're going to create, you know, we have to have research. And so thanks to, interestingly, uh, an oil and gas guy, Jay Precourt, we have an energy efficiency center at Stanford led by Jim Sweeney. And it's got fabulous people. You know, we've got a, a you know, you talked about the behavioral part. So we got one of the very few RPE grants. And so we have a lot of work that was never going on before at Stanford going on there. And, and you probably want the results of that yesterday. But at least, you know, it, it, there's that kind of momentum going on. And we get the benefit of people like George Schultz and Bert Richter. We can't, Enrico Femre is not around to help, again, clone uh, Art Rosenfelds. But at least we do have some, a lot of wisdom to be bringing to some of these young students as well. The teaching part, we're really struggling with at Stanford. And again, this is a place where I hope our organizations can partner together to figure out how to get more teaching resources. But one of the ultimate renewable energy resources, just like art has been, is my colleague Gil Masters, who wishes he was here sitting in this chair, who I think taught Eric Heitz and taught many people in this room. And Gil's still teaching as an emeritus professor. And the number of students taking his classes, you know, like many other people who are teaching here, it's just bulging from a capacity issue, and we're struggling to respond. We've got John Kumi at Stanford. So part of how Stanford's coping in the short run is we're grabbing bits and pieces of people. You know, and many of you know John participated in the oil end game effort at RMI. He's doing all kinds of great work on data centers. And those kinds of activities at Stanford, honestly, weren't happening before. Um, we brought, you know, out of desperation, honestly, we brought Amory to Stanford to come and teach. And so it's like, how can we find ways you know, while we're, while we're trying to move the tanker of our institution and build some of these partnerships, how can we inject some DNA in that will help get us where we all need to go? So there's, there's research components. And I'd just for clarification, my view, and I sit on the Precourt Energy Efficiency Center's advisory board, is that the money in that center is really being used like uh, you know those little bags of carrots we can buy at the grocery store. So they're not big carrots necessarily, but little bags of carrots to incentivize our existing faculty at Stanford to tip the work they've been doing in a variety of really important areas, but to tip their research and their expertise towards energy efficiency. And some of us say, oh, well, you know, why can't we use it for this or that? But I've actually come to really appreciate how powerful it is to take, especially given some of this, many of us at this table, energy efficiency wasn't at our core in the beginning. And we've talked about that. And so part of how we get the experience that some of, you know, what some of you need is to take people who have experience in certain areas and push it into the arena of energy efficiency and see where those benefits are. I think, and we'll hear more from some of my colleagues here, you know, there is, Dan kind of alluded to it, maybe a bit of incrementalism that we need to rise beyond. But one of Stanford's responses is, you know, around an individual faculty person like Mark Jacobson, a program blooms called Atmosphere and Energy. At its core, if you ask the students who are part of that program, what do they want to do? They want to come work for all of you. And they're taking really relevant classes to support that. So Stanford's basically, on an incremental basis, developed several interdisciplinary programs. And I think when I think of art, I think of you know kind of the the uber interdisciplinary person, and so whether we can create people at quite the art level, I'm not quite sure we can succeed in that cloning process. But there is now at least about a 10-year history of generating people like Audrey Chang, who many of you know and will speak later, who came out of an Earth System Science program at Stanford with an energy track within it. So I know I'm about out of time, but I, I think three of our four institutions here are in easy reach of PG&E's Energy Center which I think for over 10 years, and thanks to the, uh, several people in this room that that exists, that ends up being a really valuable extension and a way for college and uni you know, university students to interact with professionals who are in the class with them. And that leads to great opportunities. I think getting part of the challenge for people on the other side of the table is getting kids right out of school, in most cases, is 
is not sufficient. You really want kids who are coming through our institutions but where they're getting practical experience as well and they're getting trained. And so there are efforts. We have the fellowship program that was referred to, which is how do we get great Stanford students out into NGOs. We really need industry partners, too, to create these kinds of, of opportunities for you to date some of these students before you want to hire them. And I think there are increasing number of those opportunities available. Uh, there was allusion to the fact, I think all of our institutions, thank goodness, and Davis, I want to take my hat off to you. So I'm wearing my Stanford Cardinal colors, but I do have a Davis baseball cap. I feel like, um, you know, Davis won the, the, the golden carrot challenge that CalCEF uh, threw out to our three institutions um, and really moved to, uh, to have the, the winning business plan for an energy efficiency center and effort. And so my hat is off to you for that leadership, but it caused both Anne's institution and mine to really rise to the occasion as well. And the ripple effect of that, at least for us at Stanford, was it forced us institutionally to really reevaluate to what degree are we walking the talk at Stanford. And I believe it um, was David who referred to the fact, I just see the, the blooming in the last 10 years of the degree to which students are measuring and monitoring the buildings, our transportation systems, our fuel systems, that, that you know, we're, we're really engaged in our own physical plant and our own energy practices in a way I didn't see at Stanford 10 years ago. And I bet most of the rest of you would, would uh, agree with me. Finally, when I look back hard at your wonderful autobiography, which if some of you haven't read it, you really should. It's great. You know, Art was thinking about, I've got to get this right, bubble chamber physics, I think. And then we had an energy crisis, and his life really changed. And I think, like all my sister institutions here, you know, even if you're not paying attention to things like the inconvenient truth and everything going on in the press, the fact that Stanford's lucky enough to have th six members of the IPCC who've been at Stanford for quite some time, the sense within our institution of what the threat is and, how it, and the need to respond to it is really a pulsing signal within Stanford as an institution. And so rather students come to Stanford not thinking about energy efficiency when they walk in the door, the opportunity to feel the call once they get there, I think is really strong. Um, but I, what I see increasingly is students are coming to a university like ours, and to, I'm a gaucho by, by my own pedigree, so at Santa Barbara, and what I hear about all four of our institutions is what's so incredible, the students are coming to college saying, for bachelors, for masters, for PhDs, saying, I want to get out and make a difference. I want to work for all four of you. Help me. And our challenge institutionally is we don't have the resources to help them right now, and we need your help. So thanks for being here. Thank you, Jane. Andy Hargadon. This is, I have the pleasure of having the last word now, don't I? Yes. OK, Jean. Uh, no, I, I think I, I want to start with a couple things, the first of which is that I'm probably going to echo a lot of what other people have said or uh, in many ways certainly I know feel, but, uh, but change the emphasis slightly. Uh, we all are, are, are deeply appreciative of Art and his contribution. I, I don't think anybody would argue with the fact that Art started a revolution um, coming from physics and bringing that discipline to energy. Um, but I would also quote uh, Heraclitus, who you know, said, you can't step into the same river twice. We've come a long way since then. And, and yes, we need more arts, but I think we need not arts, but arts children and grandchildren, uh, which are going to be different. And I think it's that difference that I really want to stress right now. Um, energy efficiency was not legitimate. It wasn't a field. It's now a field, but maybe not as legitimate as it could be. And you know, the calls for more funded research and direct investments in the field are good. But if we want to look forward to the next 30 years, I would say that we need to have a fundamental uh, questioning of, of where we're going and start to aim our, our institutions, public and private, in that direction. Skate to where the puck will be, I think, is probably the, the Gretzky term. Uh, in that sense, I would say that, you know, a, a lot of what Art brought was uh, a lot of innovation to energy efficiency. Innovation is probably the key word here, the change, and not only the change that's happened there, but the change that we're looking forward to making happen in the next 30 years. And in that way, we need to understand that much of the innovation that happens in energy efficiency is a lot like the innovation that happens everywhere, uh, uh, only more so, in the sense that nothing will happen in energy efficiency if the technologies aren't, as, as Roland said, attuned to the, to the policy needs and abilities 
and to the needs of business to become sustainable and, and profitable in the long term. And none of the great research will get out if it doesn't, in fact, recognize this interdependence between technology, business, and policy. And to that extent, I would even say that what we really need to think about in terms of both our supply and the demand is a fundamental questioning of what we're producing and how we're producing it so that we can generate the next generation of, of arts, the next generation of leaders who will take us in the, next gen, you know, in the next direction that we need to go. This is a fundamental challenge for universities who have been uh, uh, very good at developing experts, developing people who are very well trained in their particular fields. Uh, you know, we, like everybody else, are taking those experts now and adding a minor, adding a, you know, a different flavor to it, whether that's you know, adding an energy minor to an existing program, uh, like we, uh, you know, we have our, our undergraduate energy minor coming on, or our energy efficiency minor, and other things. But I think we need to uh, sort of fundamentally change, and I would say it's not always a new approach necessarily, but maybe a return to the old mission of universities, particularly the land-grant institutions, which organize themselves around making a fundamental change uh, and addressing the needs of society in the moment. And to that end, thinking about how we can be producing students that answer Roland's challenge of filling the gap. Not just students in energy uh, that, that understand that, but students in energy that understand and are able to effectively change business around energy efficiency. Students in business who are able to understand the science, not just enough to talk about it, but to deeply recognize the ways in which science and, and business and policy will act together to create new solutions. And that's the generation of leadership that we need, is, is the, that set of people who can walk smoothly from DC to you know, the halls of Chevron or, or PG&E back to the labs of their universities and, and not skip a beat because they recognize and they can see the ideas that affect and, and will be effective in all of those domains. So to that end, I think I, I, you know, I started out by wanting to talk about the things that we and others are doing here, but I think you know, I, I, after listening to everybody, I do want to finish with the, you know, not, not a cup half empty, but certainly a challenge that these are the critical pieces we need to put in place going forward. How are we going to create students that are you know, T-shaped, deep in a particular expertise, but with that broad experience on top that makes them able to affect what are the critical changes we need in energy efficiency? the ones that affect science, business, and policy. I think, you know, we, like everybody else, are doing our share, our, you know, are attempting to do our share. I think we have wonderful resources with the California Lighting Technology Center and the Western Cooling Efficiency Center and the Institute for Transportation Studies and the Ag Sustainability Institute, which are sort of centers that are unique to Davis's land-grant origins in that they work as closely with industry as they do with science. And they produce leaders in, that, in, in the scientists and others who are as involved in policy as they are in science. Um, I think that, you know, to, to uh, uh, Roland's earlier point, we need to retrofit the existing workforce. I think that's a, an area that universities have fallen back on. You know, in, in response, one of the early things we did with the Energy Efficiency Center here at Davis was create the University of California Extension Program aimed at arming uh, building managers, energy managers in industry with the tools they need to make change in where they work. Uh, with funding uh, the, the Green Technology Entrepreneurship Academy, which is aimed at taking scientists, you know, full professors down to doctoral students, and helping turn their, their science into uh, concrete value propositions for readily, you know, easily identified customers so that they can actually understand what it takes to move from a laboratory uh, a process or paper to a change that affects uh, society. And I think, you know, moving on from there to, to thinking about how do we, you know, how do we shape the engineering careers of our graduates, how do we shape the engineering, or the, the sort of the energy careers of our business students, you know, bringing in minors and other programs that are allowing them to move in those directions. All of these, I, I would simply conclude with, are to try and meet that fundamental challenge I think we all need to meet, which is rethinking what we're producing and the skills that we're going to need for that next 30 years, which are people that can easily, easily bring the dialogue together between all three of those domains. Thank you, Andy. 